How do I work fast? How am I going to make 100 quilts in a year? What is the process that even makes me think this is possible? How can you use it too? Let's quilt along together and find out. Hi, I'm Amy and I make things. And in today's video, I'm making all the decisions about my next quilt. Hang around, let's see what happens. Hi guys, I am thrilled that you're joining me for the Breakdown Quilt Along. Today I am walking you through my personal approach to breaking down a quilt pattern and streamlining the process for a smooth journey and efficient sewing. The key to streamlining my process is keeping decision making and design process separate from execution. The reason I do this is because these actions use different parts of the brain. So I try to do all of my thinking up front and then I can run on autopilot for the rest of the steps. I'll highlight the areas that I think about and then walk through the specific decisions I've made for this particular remixed geese pattern. There's a ton of information here, but I'll make it easy, I promise. The first thing you wanna do is read through your pattern. Skim through your pattern. <laughs> I want to know the basics of how the designer, in this case Erica Jackman, gets to the end result. And the first thing I look at is technique. With technique, I always make sure to understand the technique or methods up front. It's like a road map and knowing the twists and turns before I hit the road ensures a smoother journey. You know, are there any techniques that I find particularly interesting or challenging? Is there a specialty ruler that I need to purchase or learn to use? Am I even going to use the same technique outlined in the pattern? If I'm not, it may change my fabric requirements, which is why I begin with technique and not with fabric requirements. For instance, there are a dozen ways to execute half square triangles. Am I using their way or my favorite way? Are there any steps I can streamline or batch to make it quicker or easier for how my brain works? My viewpoint is don't reinvent the wheel unless there's a really good reason. If the pattern is full of half square triangles and makes them by drawing that line on the back and sewing on both sides, but I prefer using triangle paper, I'll probably use the triangle paper. It's my quilt and I'm making it, so unless I'm looking to learn something specific, I'm going to use whatever method is most efficient. If there is a good reason to use the technique outlined in the pattern, like fabric conservation or construction concerns, then I need to know that now, which is why I skim through and look at how it all comes together. Some things can easily be changed without consequences, but some things can't, and I need to know that now. Directional fabric is often one to watch out for. Number two, materials. On to materials. Checking the fabric requirements early on is normal. It's where we usually begin. We flip that pattern over and say, oh, it needs 12 fat quarters and two yards of background, or a layer cake and a yard and a half of background, or whatever it is. And those are good general things to know, but the reason I start with technique is because maybe I want to use a cut of fabric that doesn't work with the outline technique or the instructions. I need to know how to integrate my methods and my materials with the pattern. We'll go back to that half square triangle idea. Let's say the pattern is written for strips and the easy angle ruler, but I don't have an easy angle ruler or I love this specific charm pack and want to use it instead. Because I read through the techniques first, I already know that I need a different half square triangle method to arrive at the same results. But I like triangle paper anyway, so there, problem solved. The point is to think about this and decide before cutting anything and gathering materials because it changes the steps and directions and potentially other fabric requirements. And don't forget backing. What about backing? Do I have the required yardage? Am I piecing something together? Do I want to make a few extra blocks to add some interest to the back? Do I need to order a wide backing fabric so that it's arrived and ready when the top is ready? And how will I bind this quilt? Also, how will I label this quilt? I could do a whole video on labeling quilts and I would need to take my own advice. <laughs> 
Whether I stick to the pattern suggestions or put a unique spin on it to use what I have or what I really like, now at the beginning is the time to decide. Number three, that's three, not that. Three, color, the fun part. Am I following the pattern's color recommendations or do I have my own vibrant palette in mind? Maybe I want a two color quilt. Do I have a pre-cut bundle to use or am I using scraps? Any of these choices might require me to alter techniques or fabric requirements depending on how the pattern is written. See, it's all tied together. But having gone through the technique decisions and the materials thought process gives me the information I need to pull fabrics from my stash or from the store and begin making color choices. Number four, construction and layout. Understanding how the pieces come together is key. It's like having the picture of the jigsaw puzzle in your mind before you even start. Can I identify any potential tricky spots in the construction process? Am I considering other layout variations? These choices don't need to necessarily be finalized right now, but they can give me insight on how to go about the piecing and block construction process. Sometimes it really matters. For instance, if I want an ombre or color shift effect, I need to know the construction and layout plan beforehand because it dictates how the blocks are pieced together. It might also dictate changes in my fabric requirements or color choices. It's all tied together. If I'm working entirely randomly, this may not matter, but that's why I think about it right now. Decide if it matters and how, or if it doesn't. I'll also look at how the quilt is assembled and determine if that works for me or if there's another option that's easier. Many quilts are join the blocks for the rows, then sew the long rows together. I personally hate that. I just, I just hate it. So I look at it and see if there's a different way. Can I web the top Bonnie Hunter style? I'll link that below. Or can I chunk it up the way Pat Sloan often does. Regardless of how I'm actually going to do it, thinking about it now saves me time later because I have a plan and when the time comes, I can just execute. Remember, separating decision making and execution is my secret sauce for efficient quilting. <laughs> it's like setting the stage. So when I cut and sew, it's running on autopilot. Number five, quilting and finishing. How frustrating are those words I always see at the end of the pattern, like an afterthought, quilt as desired. Well, duh, but what do I desire? Thinking about the quilting from the get-go can alleviate a great deal of stress and help get a quilt finished faster. It doesn't get stuck in limbo waiting for a decision because the decision, or at least a direction, is already made. Quilt as desired, treats the quilting as an afterthought. And in my world, that is a road directly to UFO land. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. When I think about the quilting and backing and binding actually, during this part of the process, it becomes part of the plan and flows through to the finished quilt at least more easily. So think loosely about the quilting now. Some things that will help you. What is the purpose of the quilt? Is it for cuddling or a baby or show? Are there areas of the design that lend themselves to feature quilting? Would it look great with geometrics or straight lines? Does it have really tiny pieces that need denser quilting? What sort of quilting do you prefer? And what color thread might look nice? These are the things that I might not be able to answer all of these questions and make final decisions right now. My cat, sorry. But the answers to these questions give me direction and a general plan about the quilting and help the project not end up in UFO land. Frankly, when I get the top finished, my brain has already moved on to the next project. So having these decisions at least mapped out a little makes a huge difference. Okay, that's a ton of information I just threw at you. There's a link down below to a PDF with a brief recap, but let's walk through what I did for the remixed geese pattern specifically. Technique. 
Remixed Geese uses the four at a time method to make the flying geese units. And this is a great method. It's quick, it makes efficient use of fabric, but I'm not using it. Instead, I'm using my AccuQuilt cutting system. I have the three and a half by six and a half flying geese die, but I'm not using that either. <laughs> I know, hang on, hang on. I am using die number, I don't know, four and five from the 12 inch cube system. One, because I have it, but mostly, number two, because I have 10 inch squares and they'll work with these two dies. But you should choose the method that you prefer. If you're making the geese pattern and you love the Eleanor Burns method, use it. Look at how it might change your cutting instructions or fabric requi requirements. Make notes on your pattern and go for it. If you prefer flip and sew, make those notes and go for it. If you're using the flying geese die, adjust for that. The point is to think about it and decide now. Next, materials choices. Look at your pattern, this one or whatever you're using, and make sure you have what you need fabric-wise. I have 10 inch squares. I have, I have an abundance of 10 inch squares that I cut. I have them, I have a way that makes efficient use of them, so that's what I'm using. Now, color, the fun part. Most of what drew me to this pattern is the vibrant, kind of chaotic, cheery color palette. So I'm using bright, happy, chaotic colors as well. I looked at the pattern picture and made a mental and actual note, you can see here, of what I liked. I like the mix of high and low contrast color combinations. I love the vivid, clear colors. And I love how the values often switch places. I like that dynamic energy, so I pulled colors to get the same feel. I mean, mine's not going to match. I know they have like a list of what fabrics they used. Mine's not going to match, but it's going to give it the same feel. If you don't like the frenetic energy of the sample or want to calm it down, you consider that in your color choices. Maybe you wanted all pinks or all pinks and greens with an occasional pop of chartreuse. Maybe you want to sketch it out and play with some color combos. If you're an EQ8 user, that's Electric Quilt 8, it's a design software program, draft it in there and play with the colors for days. The point is to make a plan and pull your colors now, prepped and laid out. If you're not entirely color confident, here is a great place to use that selvage technique that I showed in the color hacks video. I'll link that in the cards and down below. Grab that super bright, colorful fabric that you love and look at its selvage screen sequence. It'll give you a place to start. If you're using a bundle, do you need to pull in some feature colors or accents from your scraps or stash to help punch it up and make it more dynamic? Do you want a specific color running through the entire piece to give it a bit of calmness or unity? Do you want a rainbow or ombre effect where it runs from light to dark? Whatever color choices you make, now is when you decide. After the video, hang with me, there are two more steps. So before we get all giddy playing with color, there's more to think about beginning with construction and layout. For me, my colors are completely random and don't need to be put together in any certain order, so my color placement decisions will be deferred to when I lay out the blocks on a design wall later. I'll give you more tips on getting through that when we get there. If you choose a rainbow effect, for example, your color order and construction decisions need to be more detailed and thought about right now. This pattern has the blocks constructed as a two geese unit, which works great for me and then it lays them out in rows and joins the rows, which doesn't work great for me, so I marked up my pattern. You probably wondered what all those scribbles were. I marked up my pattern in such a way that I have nine patches for most of the quilt, for most of the quilt. I mean, this bottom row is a little, this, where am I? This bottom row is a little different, and look, you can see my notes, I write all over it. I'll write in my books too. Now don't write in a library book or someone else's book, but I absolutely make notes. And if you don't feel comfortable writing in your book, stick a post-it note in there and write on that. 
But I broke mine up into where it's mostly nine patches. And that bottom row is a little different, but I know that now, which means I don't have to think about it later. This way I can deal with smaller, more manageable chunks, easier to maneuver, easier for pressing, which makes it easier on my body, which is very important. You have to decide what makes it easy for you. One final step, quilting and finishing. These are loose thoughts about the quilting that sort of just hang out in the back of my mind, direction rather than final decision. I know this quilt is for cuddling. It's not for a show. So I think with my quilt being so busy, busy with color that I probably want something simple, non-distracting, all over meander or loopy design. But I also know I'll finalize that decision once I see the whole piece. The quilting decisions vary with the quilt's intended use, the construction, the consultation of my long armor, and my time and budget constraints. Regardless, it's always just, like I say, floating in the back of my mind, and it's not that critical for this quilt right now. I know I'll bind this quilt with my signature red and white polka dot, and I know I already have miles of two and a half strips cut, so that's super easy. Backing was a little harder. I'm not buying anything right now, so I know I want to use what I have, and I have a fabric that will need to be pieced more specifically because it's a border type design, and once I see the final size of the quilt, I can make that decision. But I know what I'm using and what is required, so when the time comes, the plan is already in place. And this is huge for me. I need the plan to be in place so that I can just go to it and not have to think about it, because if I have to think about it, it's automatically in UFO land. That's the process. I read through the pattern and chose my technique of using the AccuQuilt dies in 10 inch squares. I decided what color feel I wanted, and I pulled my 10 inch squares. I made a construction plan, and I know how to get there. I have a quilting idea and direction. I have my binding. I have my backing plan. Crap, label. I need a plan for a label. See, this is why I do this. This is why I do this up front. Okay, make a note. Where'd my pencil go? Okay, label. Extra blog. Okay, I'll make an extra block with light centers, write the info on it with my fabric pen. Now I have a label plan. These are all the choices that you already make for every quilting project that you do. I just front load them and think about them all at one time so that I don't have to think about them again. Like I say, thinking and decision making are different areas of the brain than execution and action. The less time I spend switching modes, so to speak, the faster I can work and the less fatiguing it is. I have a plan and now I can execute on that plan. So what now? Well, now it's your turn. Now you make all these decisions for your own quilt, be it the Remix Geese pattern or some other pattern. This week, go through the steps. There's a PDF linked below make your notes, and pull your colors. Play with the colors until they make you happy. Gather any tools you need for the quilt. Maybe choose your piecing thread. Think about how it will all come together and what's going to work for you. Find your backing and binding fabric, or at least think about them and make some notes about ideas or a plan. Think about the quilting and what direction you want to go. And don't forget that label. Think about that and make a plan ahead for it as well. I should really refer to my own PDF. For me, the decision-making phase is the most involved part of quilt making, which is why I try to do as much of it at the start as possible. Also guys, don't get too hung up on it. This is a process that I've developed and practiced over a long time. And y'all, it's quilting. It's quilting, it's not that serious. In the end, this is what works for me and you will find what works for you. So be kind to yourself as you try a new process. Next week and all the other weeks, it will be simpler. That's the whole point. Next week we talk cutting and kitting as well as additional quilty content. 
Let everyone know in the comments what color palette you're using for the quilt along. Bright and boisterous like me or something entirely different. And if you're watching along and not sewing along with us, which is perfectly fine, what color palette would you choose if you were sewing it? While you're down there, please click the buttons, like, subscribe, share, ring that bell so you don't miss anything. Now go forth and make decisions. <laughs> Take your time and remember that it's not life or death. Also, remember that you make the world more beautiful just by being in it. I'm Amy and I'll see you next time.